You know those time management apps that you install on your laptop, phone, Samsung fridge, or whatever other device you want to limit your overall usage of? Yeah, they're stupid. I made the exact opposite. Imagine this. You're trying to get on with your work, meaning opening ChatGPT, your text editor of choice, and proceeding to alt-tab between the two for the next 8 hours. But instead of being the helpful OS that Windows is, it works against you. What if when clicking on your edge, <laughs> just kidding, clicking on your Chrome icon, you're forced to watch the entirety of Shrek 2 before proceeding. Or if you want to close it, you first have to kill a bunch of enemies in Doom. Of course I'm adding Doom to this. The possibilities of enshificating your OS are limitless. Oh, and I'm also adding this. Think fast, chuckle nuts! Okay, let's get on with the project itself. The core idea is to intercept the main operations a user can do on their PC, like opening an app, closing a window, minimizing or maximizing something. I, through painful trial and error, came to the conclusion that somehow these are the safest to handle, if you don't want to temporarily or permanently break your computer. Remember kids, always use a virtual machine. And when such an event is intercepted, inject your own overlay with whatever challenge comes your way, and only get back control of your computer after you complete it. It's basically a ransomware, but at least I'm not asking you for money. Just for likes. Overall, the program has four parts. First, you have the event observers, which, as the name suggests, they observe user actions, new process launches, windows being shown, hidden, or destroyed. Think of them as passive sensors. Then, there's the decision layer. Given an event, decide whether to interrupt. Is it a system process, an elevated app, a background helper? If so, then ignore. If it's a user-launched app, and this matters because many apps, if started, launch multiple processes in the background. You may want to troll them, but if you don't select exclusively processes started directly by the user, you will end up spawning tens of challenges for the same operation. Next, there's the challenge manager. When we decide to intervene, we present a full screen overlay and pick a random challenge from a pool. The overlay acts like a velvet curtain. It prevents the desktop from peeking through while the challenge runs. Oh, and you can't exit the challenge. If the program detects it wasn't completed, it automatically starts another one, at random. And finally, the resumption logic. When the player meets the goal, the system gracefully resumes the original action. Now, to be fair, I still actually am debating over this one. Because, on the one hand, if you suspend the action, you have way more control over the user. It's way harder for them to work around it. But, and this is a pretty big one, if Windows, like the careful OS it is, notices the process hangs too much in an uninitialized step, it might actually cancel the operation. So, I'll leave the logic for suspending the process in the project, but for the final product I actually went with the safer route of simply covering it all with the overlay and letting the action complete uninterrupted in the background. Oh, and if it wasn't obvious, for this app to run it needs admin permissions. You are working with system protected APIs. You have to be prompted for that, okay? I went with the legal way of doing things. The observers themselves are of two types. First, you have process observers, in my case process start observer and process exit observer, where using Windows query language APIs I listen for instance creation and deletion events for processes, and get the process ID and name. With these properties I decide if the process is user launched or not. You don't want to start Chrome with its dozen renderers and GPU processes and get as many challenges started at the same time. And then window observers, which in my case, listens for the minimize, maximize and destroy events. With the processes, it was pretty straightforward, mostly because it's the OS that handles that, so it's pretty consistent across the board. But in the case of Windows, well, let's say for developers, the OS is their oyster. You can have hidden windows, transient pop-ups, taskbar previews, tooltips and many more variations none of which actually respect a consistent format. A simple example of this is Steam, or Discord. Sure, you have the Steam icon that you can click and opens the Steam window. However, that actually isn't a window create event, and neither is it a window destroy event when you press the red X at the top. The real Steam is the one in your tray bar, and the window is actually permanently there, but hidden, and you simply call show and hide on it. Okay, but now you'd think to also listen for window hide and show events, right? Well, can you guess which events are triggered when, for example, you hover over your open apps in the taskbar? I think you can guess it. And this is one of the many overlaps that could get you easily stuck in an infinite loop of desperation if not properly accounted for. Don't even get me started on alt-tabbing. 
Next, taking the events from the observers, as well as the associated processes, I decide if I should inject my challenge into their flows. I mainly avoid three types of processes. First, you have session 0 or system process IDs, which are Windows internals. Then you have elevated processes by admin or system. And last but not least, some specifically blacklisted apps like Task Manager, Explorer or Windows Logon and other subsystems. Okay, so now we know when we should start a challenge, or better said, when it's as close to safe as possible to do it. Similar to the process event manager that handles the observers, the challenge manager deals with handling the list of challenges, as well as running one at random when requested. The challenges are modular and I went through four types to test myself more than anything, but you can expand way beyond these. First off, the no challenge. Yeah, a challenge where nothing actually happens. I initially used this as a control group, but then I thought that it's actually more nerve-wracking if you don't know whether you'll actually have to do something or not each time. Next, playing a video. I defined a directory in which videos can be placed. I made it so you can always add more by just copying them there. Then, I choose a video at random and play it in full screen, without the option to skip, close, pause or any other video player control you can think of. Yeah, you gotta sit for the whole thing. Now, for the first two gaming challenges. For this one, I decided to make my own implementation of the game. I'm not gonna go into detail over how I did this, but here's the final look. The reason I decided to do it myself though, is because of how the challenges are structured. I wanted to make it so you are forced to reach a certain number of points before you can continue. But for my ransomware to know the amount of points a user currently has in a game, which is running in a completely separate process, there's gotta be some sort of communication channel. The easiest is a logging file, so that's what I did. I simply update a predefined file with the current score the player has in Snake, while the challenge runner constantly pauses that same file and updates its internal state. This way, when the score is reached, a signal to kill the game process is sent. And for La Pièce de Résistance, the king himself, Doom. Now, I can't go and make my own Doom from scratch like I did with Snake. I mean, I technically can, but I really don't wanna. So, I have to take the already existing game and somehow read its life state to know the current kill count of the player. First off, I went with the GZ Doom fork of the game, for reasons that you'll see soon enough. Next, I had to enable logging, which was done by creating an auto-exec config file, then spending the next 30 minutes trying to understand why it doesn't work, just to find out that it needs a gzdoom.ini file, which, after further research, I found that was moved at some point from the game directory to an app data entry, because apparently everyone hates self-contained apps. Okay, logging enabled. I open the game to see how the messages look like, to know what I have to parse. But, surprise surprise, enemy kills are not being logged. Yay! What this means is that, in order to get them to be logged, I have to do it myself. And here's why choosing GZ Doom came into play. Because it's easily moddable. I say easy, but I still spent a good while on decade-old forums. To get these events to be logged, I added my own extensions, aka a custom static event handler. No, not an event handler, a static one because normal event handlers are destroyed if a new map is loaded, and if the enemies to kill number is too high, a user may find themselves navigating to a new area, resetting the kill counter if the handler isn't static, because this one lives the entire time the game is open. In this handler, I listen for the suggestively named World Thing Died event, check if it's a killable entity and counts as a player kill, then log it to console, which in turn is sent to the log file I set up earlier. Now, the challenge implementation needs to start the Doom process with a specific WAD, make it freeware if you don't own Doom, don't be thieves, and a random map to spice things up. Then, decide the random number of enemies needed to be killed and start polling the log file for the event, using a regex to extract the current value. But be careful, other apps' log files are generally locked when those apps are running, so always open the log files in shared mode, or tail the stream with a separate reader. Once the target is reached, once again the Doom process is killed, and you can continue on with your day, until you press another button. Think fast, chocolates. And there you have it, a homegrown, organic fed, lovely ransomware, where the only thing you're losing is your time and, after a certain point, mind. Sure, it can be expanded, but Trust me, I tested the limits of safety on this, and all I have to say is that I only started using a VM halfway through, and I'm pretty sure my PC is gonna suffer from some form of PTSD because of that.